Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining Get Out of Rap. Today is a really special episode because I'm joined by Jamie Scott, the CEO of Evalue Agent. They're up to exciting things. They've always done exciting stuff, and I'm really, really looking forward to this one. So, Jamie, thank you very much for joining me today. Yeah, real pleasure, Martin. Thanks for having me on. Looking forward to it. So where do we start? Should we start with your first kind of, where did your entry into this industry start? (laughs) Yeah, good question. (laughs) Um, Probably, and I've got to go back a fair way, about 25 years ago was was when I first stepped into my first contact centre, call centre. And and before that, I'd I'd done engineering, I'd done naval architecture of all things, shipbuilding up up in Newcastle. So I'd I'd been in heavy engineering for about five years and um and and that was that was interesting, but it was about business improvement and process improvement. And then I saw I saw an advert for Orange who, if you go back to the late nineties, was that real Mm. mega cool brand. Yeah. And, and they were fast growing and they were, they were looking to build a team of sort of process improvement consultants across the contact centers. And, you know, I had those skills. That was my background. I was very lucky. Went for the interview. The guy that interviewed me, you know, saw transferable skills. I didn't have any, experience of, of of customer service at all at that stage and 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 that's where it started and i i remember walking into it was the peter lee call center at the time about 1500 heads there yeah. and it was like it was like walking but and the only <laughs> i'm gonna be careful i say this it the, my my overriding impression was it was like going back to a classroom in in primary school there were there were pictures on the walls there were there were sort of flags across various parts it was you know it was and, and the buzz and the sound and everything it was like it just blew me away yeah. I, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't believe it um and you know I spent probably about six years there and like I say just because like a lot of people who, who go into the industry fast growth, great opportunity to move through the ranks. And I started managing teams. I was involved in the what was then the exec office, which was dealing with all the complaints addressed to the VIPs and, and board members. So that was great fun. Started managing operations, started managing bigger project teams and business analysis teams. And yeah, it was it was fantastic really loved it really got into it and got a real taste for developing software and processes for both both customer improvement but also employee improvement and you know things like quality coaching feedback performance management all those types of of systems and workflows we we had a great opportunity because we had such a free reign at one. It was, it was a little bit like the wild West in those days. And, <laughs> and, and probably I might get into trouble by saying that, but what I mean by that was, you know, if you had ideas and, and you, you had a great team around you, which I did at the time, we were, we were just given, you know, phenomenal opportunities to create these things. And, uh, and I loved it. Absolutely loved it there in orange. And how long were you there for? I mean, that kind of, for me, that the way the picture you paint there is exactly how teams should be run. You know, that kind yeah. of giving people agency to say, go and be creative, you know, help yeah. us get involved. It, it was creative. It really, back in, you know, we were adding millions of customers every quarter. So you <laughs> can imagine the buzz. We, I, I joined, uh, you know, it, it had been going for about four or five years when I joined and it started as a little bureau in Darlington doing, um, you know, the, the, what were those machines that used to carry, you used to see them on the, the sort of where it just said, you know, it's to give the telephone number. And oh, just, a pager. Yeah, pager. It was a paging yeah. service out of Darlington. Wow. And it had grown. They were adding call centres in Newcastle, then in Plymouth and uh, we started doing outsourcing um, and yes, yeah, so about, about six years I was there 
And in those heady times of just, we were winning JD Power sort of mm. customer satisfaction awards year on year. And the buzz, it, it really, it was, it was that tech, it was that tech growth story of the, of mm. the nineties, really. It was, yeah. you know, we talk about these unicorns now, but they, these guys were just absolutely yeah. growing year on year. And it was, it was a great opportunity, really, really great fun. Uh, so I stayed there for about six years Um what then happened, I'd, I'd got involved. I was literally poured into um, the customer service director there across all the operations. I was doing quite a lot of, of big, all the, all the project teams, the analysis teams, the, the exec office, the big operational part of, of, of that organization as well. And the customer service director at the time moved to Barclays and quite a few of us went with him. Uh, and we uh, we went there. I have to say, I I didn't like it there at all. It was it was like night and day, you know, from the from the autonomy and everything that we could achieve in Orange to a very different business for all for all you know mm. uh, clearly understandable reasons. But even at the senior level, I was I was customer experience sort of director level there across the the various direct channels and the contact centres, and it was it was hard it was really mm. hard to get things done and i struggled there just culturally mm. just just mm. couldn't couldn't make it work and it was also a lot of time spent down in canary wharf as well and i was starting a family i just got married and it it just wasn't for me martin i must admit it was it was very different well these are all learning experiences right and <laughs> <laughs> well i think it I was given the same opportunities to build systems and implement systems around uh, by then around very much around people engagement. So really focusing on supporting agents and, and frontline operators and team leaders and coaches to build and operate those sort of quality coaching performance management training systems. And, and that was great, you know, really enjoyed doing that. And I think at that point it started to dawn on me, which was, wouldn't it be great if I could do this for myself? Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd had a fair amount of success implementing these sort of systems. And uh, it's like, I, I think I could, I could have a go at this, but, but like a lot of dreams, you come back to it, you think, well, you know what, that's great, but I've never sold anything in my life. So I um, I thought about it and I thought, you know what, I'm going to join, I'm going to try and join a commercial business where I'm going to learn some of those skills. And that's when I uh, I joined Vertex, which were, at the time was a, a pretty big global outsourcer business. Mm. It was it was private, private equity backed and um, had operations in the UK, had some great clients like Marks and Spencers and National Trust and a lot of the utility businesses. It had American operations, Australian operations, Indian operations. And I was asked and tasked to create Vertex's kind of their, their people engagement proposition. Mm. They wanted to create something that would enable them to differentiate their wider BPO service offering into the market. And um, I was lucky. One of the guys that was quite a senior uh, business development director there at the time had been the contact that I'd worked with when I was at Orange and we'd outsourced to Vertex. So I had a great relationship there. He'd seen what I'd done with the teams in Orange and he said, just, just come to Vertex. This is what we're looking for. So I went there and that's where I met Michelle and Alex, the co-founders of a value agent. And literally the three of us um, over, over about four years between, I joined in 2009. So between 2009 and 2012, we, we worked together to build um, you know, systems and processes around mm. around sort of people improvement. And it was a great success. We we managed, I think we managed to get it implemented across about 40 accounts. Wow. And towards the latter part of that period, 
we were we were being pulled into these sales meetings and these sales pitches and bids and RFPs and along with a lot of the other shared service teams but we were, we were I was getting into that sort of sales experience and and that that skill you know really enjoyed that Michelle especially who um does and has done most of our sales to date martin almost single-handedly really got a taste for it and um so that was that was a great opportunity alex was was the techie he he'd been a a, a team leader on one of the accounts and had built a, a sort of a, a system for doing quality in his own time at home completely entrepreneurial in nature and he'd come in one day and shown it to his help desk manager and said, yeah, well, let's just implement it. And it was there. Nice. Yeah. So when I joined it, we, we had we had something to build on. Uh, Michelle had been in Vertex for quite a few years and literally knew everybody. Uh, we didn't have an office that we could go to. So whenever we went into the business, it had, you know, numbers of call centers all around the country. We, Michelle would just know people and she got us into all these accounts and built the network and it yeah we just literally learned everything we needed I think in those three years at Vertex to to go it alone and start the business and you formed this kind of bond I guess as well just where yeah. importantly yeah. you know you can work together as as human beings but what was the when, when was the moment when the three of you went Come on, let's do it. <laughs> it's all about timing, isn't it? It's about right time, <laughs> right place. I think I think the seed was sown, as I said, it, it, it had always been my ambition to do this. And I've been very deliberate in in in, in setting the, the building blocks in place. But like all things, it came to a point, Vertex, as I said, they were private equity owned. And in early 2012, it became apparent that they were going to divest and they sold bits of, of Vertex to Capita, bits to Serco. Um, they, they maintained some of the North American operations. And during that time, obviously, the shared service team that had been across all these accounts was, was becoming mm. increasingly redundant. Mm. So the team was getting smaller and smaller and various, various sort of... Um, services and capabilities were coming to, to to the central place where where Michelle and Alex and I were based and it was like the timings the timings getting close I I was very lucky at the time to live next door to one of my uh, first angel investors Alistair Waite and he along with the second investor that came on board at that time Neil Stevenson they'd recently sold or exited from their cloud hosting business. So I had a fair bit of cash in the pockets. And I uh, I sort of tapped Alistair up one day and said, listen, I've got this business idea. It's about building this sort of platform for call centers to, to manage and improve performance of, of employees and agents and team leaders. And got my little business case together and my, and my slides and literally in the pub in the village here where we where we both lived at the time um over a couple of pints went through it he said yeah i'll give you some money i'll convince neil to give you some money and that was it you know we got we got the seed investment and i resigned literally well i actually resigned before we got the money uh i took <laughs> a little bit of a risk because he, he gave me his word and i thought you know what i'm so excited i want to do it yeah so um <laughs> Alex and I resigned um, literally the next day. Uh, we had to build a platform before we mm. could sell it. So Michelle yeah. stayed in Vertex. We kept we kept Michelle in Vertex for a little while, and and we literally spent six months building this this platform, which was the which was the forerunner of of where we are today. We call it the legacy value agent platform, and like all good salespeople we started to sell it before it actually existed <laughs> yes <get> and <laughs> uh and you know that that's almost another story but but yeah that's mm. how it starts it, it literally mm. is right time right place and uh, you know have a vision and a dream yeah and 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 just going for it you know mm. and um 
the best one of the best decisions I ever made, certainly career wise. And just from that kind of point of view, um, did you notice anything different in how you thought or operated? <laughs> yes, I did, but not for six years. And and that's the interesting story because um having having worked in arguably orange corporate very large enterprise business and although it was very um there was a heck of a lot of autonomy it was still a corporate so i i had that background and then of course i had orange and then vertex so i literally created a business uh, a, a a startup business in the mold of an enterprise business <laughs> and um and there's some big lessons there you know um we 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 in the early days recruited people from that corporate world and you know 10 years later martin you can you can much better define what a startup is mm. the type of entrepreneur or person who wants to work in a startup but but even back then 10 years ago it it was still it wasn't quite as defined or 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 high profile as a, as an opportunity as it is today Mm. And that was a big mistake I made for the, for the first six years. What we effectively did was we sold the platform to another big global outsourcer, Atos. And um, Atos at the time were bidding for uh, national savings and investment uh, renewal NSNI contract. They were running the that 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 bid, and again another contact of ours who'd seen what we'd done at Vertex had moved over to Atos and said, well, if you're setting up this business, Jamie, and it's you and Michelle and Alex, just come across here, help me sort of, you know, mm. into the bid, yeah. put this, put this solution, this, this, this solution that you've built. And, and that's what we did. And they have, they of course won that, won, won that bid very successfully. And before you know it, we, we had Asos as a client and we were we were implementing the the value agent sort of legacy platform into that into that business. And what we effectively fell into was we'd moved as a little team in Vertex to a little team in Atos. <laughs> yeah. And and although we were, you know, within year two, I think we were pulling some pretty serious money from 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 that client to, to do what we were doing um it, it wasn't dramatically different we'd just mm. become a, an outsourced department of atos um, <laughs> yeah. and 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 like i say that was it was fun but with one very big large demanding client and this isn't anything against atos it's just the nature of the beast mm. um with one client with 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 a lot of demands you end up customizing a solution to that one client mm. and before we knew it we'd created a, a very customized piece of software uh for 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 that client that that we were struggling to sell to other people because it wasn't overly configurable and mm. we had to spend a lot of time and effort to customize it to to other to other clients um, I think the best, I don't know if it's a funny story or not, but I'll tell it. We, we'd created a, this, this QA solution and I, at the time, I thought it was a great idea to be, you know, down with the kids and, and the millennials to, 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 instead of talking about passes and fails, we talk about wows at one extreme, which seemed to go down yeah. very well, but at the other extreme, I came up with this idea to call them OMGs. And yeah. I thought that'd be that thought that'd be a great yeah. idea. Yeah. But of course it wasn't a great idea and it went down like a lead balloon, but we'd hard coded it into the platform. So every every time, or you could almost predict it, it became the uh the <laughs> the joke within the business. Who's gonna who's gonna complain about it today? <laughs> and and we used to think, oh no, we're gonna and we, we it it would have involved a complete, not a complete, but a significant rewrite of the software. So, so we we got ourselves into a fair bit of trouble, um, and it, and it, that six years it was. I use this um, I use this phrase quite a bit. It's like a corporate overcoat. 
that I think a lot of people wear sometimes. Mm. And it's it's very protective and it it helps to get things done sometimes, but it's also very, very constraining. Mm. And it can be. And, and and we were wearing that for too long. And after about six years, so between 2012 and 2018, we'd started to pick up some other clients. So we were doing okay, but we were still about 80% of our revenue. And, and this was seven figure revenue at this stage mm. was, was coming from, from Atos. Mm. And then one very fateful day, and I remember it, <laughs> I got, I got an email from Atos procurement. We were coming up for renewal. And they 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 mentioned that their telephony platform uh, had come with um, with the with the QM and the workforce management solution bundled in, and they weren't going to renew a value agent as a result because they had access to to the tech, and as a result, we literally lost about eighty percent of our revenue just overnight like that, and. Wow. At the time, <laughs> it was scary. It was the worst thing OMG. that ever happened. It was OMG. It really was, and a bit more. Um, but um, it was it was the best thing that could have happened to us because mm. uh, Michelle and Alex and I and a, and a few other members of the team who were still in the business and they'll 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 have their own story that goes with this. But we decided to completely pivot dump completely the legacy platform and we spent literally the rest of 2018 rebuilding the the platform as it is today completely mm. configurable SaaS based had all the learnings of now combined decades of experience and we had this this solution and we you know mm. we put our blood sweat and tears into it it turns out that although Adatos had made the decision to stop using us, it took them over 12 months to transition. So whilst we felt we'd lost all that revenue, we didn't lose it for about another 14 months, which was mm. great. We built the platform. And then in 2019, literally when, when the business as it is today was, was born, um, we launched that platform. And we we just started to pick up clients who who saw the the power of the system we were offering at the time, and and it that was the start of the business. So very long winded answer to your question, Martin. Forgive me, but no, I loved it. <laughs> it it comes back to that one moment with Atos where it was a dawning realization that we weren't this super fast growth tech startup business we were a little outsource department of atos but from 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 that very moment of that decision from atos that changed everything and it mm. took six years but mm. we've ne we've never looked back because then we became the the business that really agile fast growth tech business that, that, that we are today still and we've tried to really embed that culture uh, into everything we do um and and that 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 seems to be working really proud of that mm. i'm i'm not surprised what an impactful story i feel like i would be doing my listeners a disservice because i would like to just indulge my, <laughs> indulge myself for a bit because um there's so much in your story that you know i'm i'm a mosquito in terms of lifespan in comparison to your good selves around making you know removing that corporate overcoat right yeah and kind of i feel like i'm i've been mainlined like in the matrix films just learning <laughs> and insight in a very short space of time and just your honesty around kind of having great ideas i always say i don't i'm not too hard on the previous version of myself because at that time i thought that was a good idea yeah. but now i've evolved to realize the previous version of me didn't have such such a great idea it, it, but it's part of being an entrepreneur i think martin and, and yes. you can be an entrepreneur building your business or you can be an entrepreneur in in a corporate you know we, we've mm. got a quite a large number of corporate clients now and you know we may never sell to a barclays 
but we've sold to a DHL and a Samsung. It, and it's not because they're enterprises that we might not sell into them. You need to connect with people who share that that cultural outlook of, you know, failing fast, trying different things, enjoying the experience mm. and learning from it. And you can do that, frankly, anywhere. It's mm. easier to do it when it's your vision, your business. Mm. Mm. But um, I think you've just got to enjoy what you do, haven't yeah. you? You know, yeah. and I think... I, the, the matrix reference is, is absolutely perfect because I don't know if it's a blue pill or the red, I can't, but you, mm -hmm. once you've taken that pill, whatever color it is, yeah. there, there is no going back. Yeah, There is no going back. And it's not for everybody, but if you want to do that, it's easier than ever before to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, when we set up the business of value and we needed these servers, even three years before we set up the business, if we'd wanted to do what we were doing, We'd have had to go out and buy mega hardware and all sorts of stuff. Mm. We just mm. tapped into Amazon, AWS, and mm. we were we were spinning up, you know, everything yeah. we needed in a matter of hours, a matter mm. of minutes now, believe it or not, we can spin up a new instance. And it's that just opens up everything. Mm. And would you say, um, so from a leadership point of view, the fact that you'd seen this kind of you, you'd worked in an environment where you were given agency and you could be creative and then you'd also experienced a more restrictive kind of does all that come in, does all that experience come into play in terms of the environment that you want to lead it's 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 tangible your pride in your in your business but what about the culture that you that you have yeah i think I think that's the that's the great thing that you can do when you when you build a business. You can effectively mold it into the culture that that is that you value. And and if I just look back a little bit, in in Orange, in the first few years at Orange, very fast growth, people getting promoted very quickly, myself included, but getting to the end of the day thinking. Not all the time, but sometimes, yes, I've made I've made another day and I've not been found out. <laughs> and and yeah. that that you call it imposter syndrome now, don't we? You know, but that's yeah. always there. And there's there can be a lot of that in certain businesses. I've never subscribed to that. And I in those early days at Orange, even I I found it really hard because I couldn't didn't feel I was connecting with anyone at a level that i wanted to connect I, i'm i'm very open perhaps too open i think it's a double-edged sword you have to be a bit careful but i i've 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 pinned my my uh flag to that mast and, and openness is the way to go without upsetting people but just you know just mm. just be really clear about what what's important mm. to to you and what you want to achieve and how you want to do it and hopefully bring people on that journey and let people do the same. So that's important. Didn't quite have that in the early days of my career, but then an individual joined Orange. He'd been the CS director at um, first, uh, first Direct, and he came into Orange. And this guy was, was, was so open and passionate. And, and I thought, yes, you can you can get to a certain level by being like this because I'd started thinking I'm going to have to change if I want to be successful. This guy came in and, and learned a lot from, from him, really did. Um, the good and the bad. Mm. But then when I started to build my own teams, you can get into trouble. And I, I did get into all sorts of trouble in the very early days of leadership. And I like you, I look back now and I cringe <laughs> uh, some of the things and this nonsense I got myself into. Um, but you learn, like you say. Mm. And when I set the business up and, and and based on the teams I'd already built over the years, it was super important to, to really get the right people. Um, and, and that's very much around that passion that's, that's so important. Um, the generosity of time in terms of, helping 
and going the extra mile for your colleagues, for your clients, for everybody around you. And then the curiosity mm. and really wanting to learn and, and, and really, you know, sort of develop yourself and those around you and the business around you and the clients that you're working with. So, so that became in the early days, you don't overly think about it. We, we, we talked before about, um, you know, yourself as you get older and as your business gets older, you know, your business better. And we've been able to, to really articulate those sort of values and behaviors, uh, quite, quite, you know, quite, quite strongly in the business today. We've always recruited there. And when there's, when there's a small group of you and you're all involved in recruitment, you can, you can, you know, make sure that works as the business grows. And we're, we're almost, we're just over 50 now. So as more people are getting into the recruitment process, it's, it's even more important that you can yeah. instill and, and, and it's not just about talking about these words. Uh, you, you've kind of got to live it. And that's the yeah. hardest thing. Cause we, we love talking about these things and it's, and I, I, you know, <laughs> I really uh, get it wrong sometimes, but it, it's a it's a desire, it's a it's an ambition to be moving towards that all the time. I think if anyone goes out and does some research around you and Value Agent and put that together, the, the, their research in a word cloud, the things that would come out would be passion and curiosity. So it's interesting that you that you you say that because those were some of the things that I had ri- I've had written down here. oh wow okay well that's if, if we're doing yeah. that and that's coming across um because yeah. we we were talking before we started weren't we about how you can when I talk like this I love talking about this and and, and connecting with like-minded people like yourself it, it, it's great fun but getting it down in words in collateral and and, and documents and websites We've struggled for for a while to get that right, but I think again we were talking earlier when you when you get to that stage and it starts to resonate, um, it's great. You still mm. we still meet people, and this is the downside of passion. Perhaps sometimes I was I was um, I was talking to to somebody recently, and he was I'd asked him to sort of critique sort of a pitch deck because we're, we're in the middle of, of a funding round at the moment and um and I, I'd asked him to look at it and he was he was he didn't like it didn't like the branding didn't like the messaging and that's quite hard to take sometimes you think <laughs> oh. but and it's a it's it's not for everybody mm. you yeah. know we, we we get asked about who our ICP is our ideal customer profile and We've started talking about the first thing we do is check for that cultural connection, because if if they're not interested in sort of driving improvements to customer experience through improving employee experience and really investing and and working with their frontline staff and everybody in the in the centre to drive that outcome then they're not going to buy us. Mm. They're probably going to stick with spreadsheets when it comes to Mm. quality or coaching. They might stick with the solution that comes bundled with their telephony platform. And that's cool, but they're not somebody that we're going to be able to sort of show the value of and connect and and do great stuff together. Mm. And, And that's always hard when you're under pressure to drive revenue um it's you you've 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 got to you've got to find and and work with people who who share that passion and and share that that vision almost and and what's lucky for all of us is there are people that that subscribe to that Mm. uh you know a lot of the stuff that you're doing with 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 team leaders it's great to see because they are they are arguably the the most undervalued resource that you could think of in in the customer service world yeah but so much lives and dies there that if you're not supporting that cohort properly they're not going to be able to do what they need to do with their teams and they're not going to convince their um seniors to to invest and the, and the whole thing falls apart i think you're dead right i think you have to for me, there's a like a 
a conviction so the, the the passion has a as a target and there's a conviction behind knowing that you can do some good um then it then like you say i lo- i love the idea of kind of that you know what you could use our stuff and it can work absolutely because we're proud of its features and benefits and but actually if you really want to make this partnership fly then it comes to what's ha- what are your values and that yeah. and that's the kind of well actually we really want to empower our people and make them expert coaches because we know if we do that their teams will be able to deliver everything we want and enjoy doing it well yeah. great yeah we're going to help you do it this is going to help we're absolutely together on this you know yeah that then is just brilliant yeah it it is it's and it makes it so much more enjoyable because, you know, there's nothing worse than just trying to convince a client of the value of doing some of the stuff we offer where it's like, well, I, I can get it for, for $3 a user a month over here, or yeah. I can use spreadsheets. And it's like, okay, okay, uh, I'm not going to be able to convince you. Yeah. You know, and you get to a certain stage where, you can you can qualify hard and you can target the right because there are as we said there's luckily <laughs> certainly lucky for us there's enough prospects and clients out there everywhere around the world it's not it's not a geography thing at all these days that they're, they're, they're there you know and 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 there's nothing better than working with these types of clients because you learn so much um and you, you're just talking to to people who share the same sort of views and and ambitions it's great. Mm. Do you think there's something in just how you were talking then? Um, it's difficult to, I don't want to come across like condescending, but it's something around education around quality and the power that it has. So you, it's not just, if it if it's this thing where people can just go, well, we can do it here. And sometimes we won't do it because let's be honest, it's just letting us know some, it's just a health check. And you're like, no, this is, this is a real engine that if you focused on it could power your customer experience your employee engagement mm. how do you broach that kind of knowledge gap yeah it's it, it it's a good question because you've got to talk as always when you're selling everything don't you it's all about benefits and and really mm. trying to to understand what what's really driving this person or this 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 prospect or or client you're talking to what is, what is really important to them i think one of the things that i learned and and, and was a, a great part i guess of my success from an early stage was if you can press the right buttons with people whether it's about saving costs whether it's about making more sales whether it's about winning jd power for another year on the run um or whether it's about just looking after your people you identify what's important and then you talk about the capabilities and the offerings and the and the deliverables in those terms and it's different Mm -hmm. for everybody but the one thing i i learned again quite quickly is if you can then start to put numbers to it you're on your way so that helps Mm. and and we've done a lot of work with clients over the years who want to buy our software but they can't make the business case work so that becomes quite an important thing because it's a decision at the end of the Mm. day and it's typically Mm. a fact-based decision so we start there but then and I was talking to somebody over the weekend about this with 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 the introduction of things like AI and and really what you can do with the technology that also suddenly becomes another button you can press because we all know a lot of people get excited about just so let's start with the technology and and let's get you excited and you know we we, we're just in the the early stages of of launching a, a a chat gpt powered we're going to call it and we are calling it smart quality and it's about introducing that technology to be able to very relatively easily write prompts and queries in your scorecard that you can automate. And we've been testing this for quite a while, Martin, as you'd imagine. But the 
power of the technology now whereby we tested it against conversations, transcribe calls, tickets, emails, chats. And this technology not only scores, but it gives you the rationale for the score. It gives you coaching yeah. hints and tips. And when we started to test it against the accuracy of the manual scoring, we could get it, let's say, about up to about 85% the same and I'm, I'm using i'm not saying accurate the mm. same as the manual score and and one of the things that we uh i had to do with the engineers this 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 last friday because they were going a little bit down a rabbit hole they were trying to make it that close that 15 percent. and when we really looked at it what you find is actually the chat gpt has marked it correctly based on the guidelines that are available and what it starts to prove is that 15 percent difference is where we're relying on some might call it subjectivity and experience some might call it bias and so you're getting to talking about the capabilities in in the context of technology and for certain people that becomes very exciting and when you see this stuff it, you, you get blown away so it so it's about pressing the right buttons with people that what's important to them that that is that balanced scorecard you know cost customer people sales and then you've got this technology element all of a sudden because let's face it some of this stuff is not the most exciting stuff in the world <laughs> yeah. but it's <laughs> so important mm. And we have that passion, but I'm smart and experienced enough to know that the reason I'm doing it is not the reason that somebody else might want to do it. I'm doing it for me. Quality is a means to an end. And what I mean by that, no matter how you do it, it's about collecting enough information to have a meaningful conversation with an agent to help them improve. And that comes back to that really big thing important for me, that curiosity, the passion, the learning to do a better job next time. Because let's face it, the vast majority of people fall into that category. Mm. We all mm. want to do, you know, the right thing, a good job. And it's not 100% of the time, but the vast majority of time, for the vast majority of people, I believe, strongly believe that applies. Mm. So with that, that's important, how you then sell it and how you implement it and, and get people engaged, it, it's just about, yeah, making sure that you're talking the right language. But at the core of it, it's about improving and supporting agents on, on, on the phone, on, on email, on, on chat, across every channel. It's, it's, mm. it's, it's the most important thing for me. I couldn't agree more. And just it, you know, I shifted in my in my seat when you were talking about some of the some of the things that you're and you're imminently launching this are you or when? Yeah, yeah. So we uh, <laughs> we you know the first of March, it came out of I use it for, so Skunk Works, which is literally one of the engineers was tasked to go away and just just work out everything you can about Chat GPT. And, and, and he came back and he started presenting and it was like, oh, wow, it, it really was, you know, wow and OMG all together because it's, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's exciting and scary. It, you've kind yeah. of got you've got you've got the vision of a, of, a, of a slightly different start to a Terminator film on one level. <laughs> and then you've got, wow, the impact that this could have to the industry for all the right reasons on the other. And we're trying to end up somewhere in between. So the 1st of March, we thought, right, we're going to go for it. We'll pull the team together. We're going to drive it. I could, and I, I'm not, I'm going to be completely honest to, to reinforce the point. Purely coincidentally, OpenAI launched the, the API that same day. Mm -hmm. And the price of it came down by 10 times. So all of a sudden, it's now commercially viable. I've got access to the API. I can do this at scale. 
and we've spent all of March. And the great thing about it, Martin, is because we have built the platform based on workflows. So we've really understood how you do quality and how you then use the data, reporting, engagement, feedback, coaching, performance management, training, that all exists. All we're doing is taking this technology and we're plugging it into our well-defined processes mm. such that by literally the first week of April, which I'm hesitating because it's getting very close <laughs> all of a sudden, yeah. um, we, we launch what we're calling Smart Score, which is a way of just just not replacing the process to start with. What we thought would be really useful would be we'll make the testing of it for free. We will make it really easy to bring some sample calls or tickets into our system. If you don't want to do a, an integration with one of the you know, tens of integrations that we've got set up, just drag and drop some files. They'll get transcribed. They'll get summarized. They'll, all the moments will be will be automatically assigned topics, if you like, or descriptors. And you can then apply some automated scorecards at the press of a button. So we're not replacing the process. What we're doing is it's almost like a co-pilot. Yeah. As a QA analyst, mm. you've got your conversation, you've got your scorecard, and at the press of a button, you can automate some of this and it'll, like I said, it'll score it. It'll give you the reason why it scored it that way. It will give you some coaching tips that you can then cut and paste into feedback for the agent directly and use as a basis of a coaching session later on. And you can change the score if you want, because it's not that computer says no type of approach. It has to have that manual intervention. So it's the best of human machine you can do it faster. You can do more of it as a result. You can get the coverage. You can reduce risk and you can get some really deep, rich insight. And like I said, if you if you do it a certain way, you can then calibrate and, and make sure that you're removing some of that bias. Um, mm. Just one example, if I may grammar we have a client who 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 evaluates grammar in the in the chat and uh, some very clear guidelines on what good and bad and indifferent is and then we saw some that that manual qa had scored and then we we did the the smart score on it and there was a difference and then you really look into it and actually you might argue that the the, the 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 smart score is is the correct one because it's it's followed the yeah. guidelines to the letter literally and that that becomes quite a powerful tool in its own right and i think just the whole disruptive positively disruptive element of it right which is this the way you've just described it there's no better example of previously talking to people about get your guidelines right you, your line yeah. items in your scorecard of course everyone recognizes that that's for them that is the visible representation of quality yes but actually the guidelines behind it are it may be more important than the actual line items yeah yeah and this is what a what a great demonstration i think that whole democratization you know letting people have a have a go letting people see what's possible um getting excited about having because i always think you know quality has been maybe a, a step behind in looking at what are we actually asking quality teams to do mm. now are they could they become and you know to love a sporting analogy but, but could they become like the performance drivers of a team by really getting into some, do you know what, if we, here's, here was a speed output in the final third of the game, you know, that kind of stuff rather mm -hmm. than, yeah, six out of 10 performance, everything was normal. And if you think, okay, the technology, your uh, chat GPT and the open AI can say, here's some, here's, here's some, here's some stuff that will pick up a, a big chunk of your work. Mm -hmm. And it would do it in a way that, and I always used to think, you know what, if you, the handoff to the team leader 
you know, and be giving them the tools and the clarity around here's what we found, go and coach this. If he, if it can do that and it's giving coaching tips and then it is maybe freeing up time for the quality team to do some really cool stuff. Mm. Some really cool stuff, you know. I think I think it's it, it it's making it really interesting and exciting for 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 the quality team especially because it's augmenting and enhancing a process and removing some of the more mm. you know monotonous activities because let's face it, sort of evaluating a, a chart or a or a ticket for grammar, uh, if you can get a machine to do that. You can then focus more on the yeah. softer skill side of things, which are going to be a much more meaningful conversation in due course. And that becomes mm. really important. Um, and and then, of course, you've got the added option and the opportunities for really starting to identify those moments. And then all of a sudden we've got a few clients that are using this type of technology and everybody in the business is going to them now. They've got marketing on, yeah. the, on them. They've got products. They've got logistics. They've got the board. They've, I bet they didn't know where they were at first. They, 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 <laughs> they're sitting on an absolute gold yeah. mine. Yeah. So from, a, from a quality team now, yeah. that gets raised. Their opportunities are, 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 are sort of um, significantly better than ever before. But they, it, it almost, and I dare to say this, Martin, but quality then becomes business and mission critical. Mm. As business and mission critical as your CRM or your contact or your core management systems, mm. because the business looks at that and says, you know what, we could just learn so much from understanding what's not only to improve agent performance, mm. but what are customers really saying? Mm. Not just on that wafer thing, 2% of, of conversations that are being evaluated now, but 10, 15, 20, and potentially up to 100% in due course. But mm. let's let's build it out and get it really, you know, as, as, as powerful as possible. And then from a sampling perspective, you know, once you're at 30%, you, you've yeah. got a very, very clear idea of what's going on. doesn't necessarily mm. have to be 100%. My sales team would hate me for saying that because we're we might be leaving money on the table for that. But the reality is, yeah, it's, it's just about the insight. You don't 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 follow all of the marketing bump on this sort of stuff because yeah. you know the 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 statistician inside me is screaming all you. the time yeah. saying just just be it's, careful. Yeah, <clears throat> it's still statistically valid, isn't it? Absolutely. Crazy, though, isn't it crazy that it is considered a bold statement? that quality could become uh, mission critical to customer experience. Because mm. if we are serious as an industry about delivering a great customer experience and employee experience, quality has to be critical. Because, you know, if you go right back to your um, the start of your career, if as a naval, you know, a naval architect, and I know I'm oversimplifying here, but they said, has, has the design of this boat, have you quality checked it? No, not really. Okay, yeah, fine. Let's launch. You know, it, it seems like it's our our industry is the one where quality, there is still there is still areas where or parts of the industry where people will go, yeah, we, we do quality when we can. Mm, <laughs> okay, yeah. well, yeah. the rest of the world doesn't exist like that. I think I think what the, the the most exciting thing for me, both as a practitioner and a and as a seller, if you like, of the technology, is the fact that if we get the technology right, if we layer it into the process, if we make the process much more efficient, much more valuable for some of the reasons I've said, then people start to think, you know what, this is this is not to be ignored. Mm. I can scale this at a reasonable cost and the benefits to me and my business, no matter whether it is any of those things and benefits I've talked about under those high level headings, it becomes really, really important. And mm. I don't think it is too much of a bold statement to say it will become mission yeah. critical if we get the right 
technology, the right approaches, the right companies who truly recognize it and then truly start to differentiate themselves in a way that you can't really, if everybody's using chatbots, because by the very definition, that's all systemized to be almost the same. If you want to differentiate, it has to be about your agents. And if it's all about your agents, it has to be how you measure, coach, perform, support, engage them. And, and that's that's the message. That's what we're really all about. And and I think I think more so than ever, COVID did help really bring this to life a little bit because we're all increasingly wanting that connection and we missed it and we understand all of a sudden how powerful it is. We might have taken it for granted previously that's really helping to fuel this this sort of viewpoint that you know that human to human interaction experience if you get it right it's mm. it's 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 majorly powerful mm. too many adjectives now but you know what i mean it's it's it, important i i look i pr- i applaud and i'm i'm fully i'm fully behind you on this um this mission i think it's i think it's great what you're doing and i couldn't agree more with uh what you've spoken about and actually from a a person just kind of starting on a entrepreneurial journey late in life um it's been it's been inspirational kind of listening to you to you talk so thank you jamie scott ceo of value agent for for coming on personally and behalf of everyone that's listening thanks very much brilliant thanks a lot martin it was a great pleasure